the feeling when you sink yourself into a sofa at the end of a long day ah oh, it almost feels like a hug from a loved one that's why we at durian have crafted sofas that can handle everyday chaos and still look amazing do visit your nearest durian store or our website durian.in to explore our stunning collection of sofas in leather leatherette and fabric all of which comes with an unmatched 5 year warranty get your hands on the grand festive offer with flat 50% off on select furniture your dream sofa awaits only at durian choose the luxurious comfort you deserve Hi there folks and welcome to the Mexican GP review on the Inside Line F1 podcast. Now, we had somewhat of a Mexican GP in a way. It was a race for a few seconds until Sergio Perez crashed out and eliminated all hopes of A a Ferrari win and B somewhat of a special Sergio Perez performance. But that's not going to be the main story that we discuss on this episode. We've got a lot to talk about. We're going to be talking a lot about Sergio Perez's start. We're going to be talking a lot about Daniel Ricciardo waiting in the wings and his phenomenal weekend. A lot more on Lando Norris's recovery and asking the question that is he making far too many mistakes in qualifying? Then of course we need to talk a lot more about Mercedes, about their upgrades, about it potentially not working as well as we'd imagined it would, and eventually talking about the underrated drivers from this race because I get a feeling. a couple of the good performances have really gone unnoticed so let's dive right into it firstly my name is somal arora i'm the host of the moro gp indian grand prix uh, right here at the buddh international circuit and also i'm the host and voice and commentator of the indian racing league of star sports joined as always by kunal shah the former marketing head of the sahara force india formula 1 team along with being an fia accredited formula 1 journalist for the via play network in norway now this race kunal what do i say i firstly i mean it happened at what an ungodly hour in india like it started at 1:30 pm and then 1:30 am in the night which means that it's already tricky to stay awake but after the crash after all that we had eventually after seeing that max was just in clear air it made it very tricky to enjoy it did you have fun watching really well actually you said we had some sort of a race but actually we had two Mexican Grand Prix happening because literally around the halfway mark there was a red flag. There were two starts and the opening lap. The start is great fun. I think the Mexican Grand Prix, in very different ways, again had interesting narratives. Yes, Max Verstappen won, but he won against. He won in a way that we all pretty much didn't think he would. You know, we thought the the Ferraris would challenge him. they would have you know gamesmanship going into turn 1 they would block him two reds against two red bulls etc you know the usual stuff but none of that happened you know max verstappen won literally you know meters after the start he found a gap between the two ferraris and he went for it saying you know what no slipstream doesn't matter i'm just going to go for it he made a dash he won 16th race win in a season 51st race win in his Formula One career, equaling Alan Prost, incredible, incredible stuff. And you know, I don't know. Should we just read out the race results so people know uh, what the race was like? Who eventually finished where? Because thankfully, there were no post-race penalties, which sort of cleared up the final race results. Samuel. Yeah. So in P one, of course, we had Lewis Hamilton. We had then Charles Leclerc finishing second. So redemption for both of them after disqualifications last time out. Carlos signs on the podium. Incredible stuff. And you might be saying, "What do you mean?" Well, we're talking about Formula One point five because when we had our race preview, we spoke about how we had what was it? What uh, four different Formula One point five winners in the last six races? I think we've added another one with Lewis Hamilton in there. I mean, by all conventional means, it's a boring season. But when you see the chaos happening over there, incredible stuff. But no, the legitimate, legitimate race results: Verstappen P one, Hamilton second, Leclerc third, Carlos Sainz eventually ending up in fourth. But the big performer, the one that we'll really spend a lot of time on, is Lando Norris in P five. 
with George Russell in sixth, Daniel Ricciardo finally getting some great points. I think beating Alpha Tauri's entire season haul in one race by getting P7 eventually. Oscar Piastri in eighth, Alexander Albon again in the points. Incredible result, P9. And Esteban Ocon finishing 10th, followed by Gasly 11th, Sonora 12th. Sonora loves P12. Uh, Nico Hulkenberg 13th in his 200th start. Shoguanyu 14th, Bottas 15th. Sargent and Lance Stroll along with Alonso, Magnussen, Perez, all not classified. That's the race this story in the table. What point do we attack first, Kunal? Because, okay, let's attack the start first. Do we talk about the driver going underneath the sponsorship first? Or do we talk about the driver going underneath his level of performance? Do we talk about Leclerc or Perez? <laughs> I think we should talk about Perez because there was so much hope. He was literally re- leading just by maybe a few meters or few, no, a few, few millimeters or centimeters at the entry of turn one on the outside on the ideal line. Got a little, no, got very over ambitious, not little. Went for nationalistic pride, wanting to win in the, you know, at the first corner. He said, I wanted to win for the fans. But hey, he's been in the sport long enough to remember two things. To finish first, you need to first finish. And then the second, yeah. the race is never won at the turn one of the opening lap, but it can often be lost there. And that's what happened to Chaco Perez. It would seem like a very emotional move, clearly, right? And sure, you can't quite... uh, How do I put it this way? Sergio Perez came out in the post-race interview and he said that he was proud of the move and proud of his thought process of making it. I I agree with the thought process part because sure, you've got to go and make big risks, right? You've got to take all your chances. But that's such a carbon copy of what Hamilton had in Qatar in a way. And sure, the racing incident uh, flag was waved all the way through to make sure that we didn't get any penalties. Fair enough, but... How can you be proud of a move like that, Kunal? It just doesn't add up to me. It feels like it feels like the rational decision making of Sergio Perez, which we all love him for, by the way, which is what we all became Sergio Perez fans for in the first place. I don't see that with that particular move. Uh, it feels like the emotions are getting to him, which I know it's an easy thing to say sitting on the outside. We never really know what's going on in the mind. But, I mean, when you see a racing driver make a move like that, you can tell they're not thinking 100% clearly of everything. Unfortunately, yes, that's possibly the truth. Again, no judgments, but we've seen racing long enough. We've commentated on racing long enough. We've shared our opinions on racing long enough to be able to say this, that it is all in the head, which probably where it went wrong in the first place. All the emotions, pent-up emotions, mind you, given he, that he's struggling. And, you know, Samuel, the funny thing is, Perez has usually never struggled in uh, midfield cars so much mentally because maybe when you're in the midfield, the pressure and the the focus and the attention isn't so much. Scoring points, maybe an odd podium is good enough. But here in the Red Bull, the pressure is just so much higher. It's either a win or you have to definitely be on the podium. So that's probably where it went. And, you know... One no. second. Sorry, I, I, I just have to bring it in. Are you just basically saying Helmut Marko's next news interview is going to be that Sergio Perez is a midfield driver, not a top but driver? But is he not? Because I, Is he not a midfield driver in the Red Bull this year? He's been more in the midfield than at the top of the field. I mean, if, in an ideal world scenario, let's assume he was a top of the field driver, which is what he's been hired for. He would have had more second place finishes than he's had. He would have had more wins if he's had, I would say. So in my view, he's been a midfield driver in a top field car. And he's what, had two DNFs in the last four races? Lewis Hamilton in a car which is not always been a second place car or second fastest car, in a car which almost didn't have a side pod for the first 10 races of the season, is just 20 points away from the most dominant car in history, which is what, by the way, Checo Perez is driving. I think... And and I don't know we shouldn't be spending far too much time raining down on this parade, Kunal, because home race, probably the worst result you can imagine over here. But do you see a way back from here? Now, I, I'm not saying the Red Bull are going to sack him tomorrow. But in terms of confidence, right, I think that's the thing that's missing out. Because we all say that, hey, lots of terrible results in a great car. But why is it happening? Why is he not getting the results? And looking at the onboards, looking at the way he's driving, looking at all the media reports and all that he's been saying to the press, it seems like he's lost confidence in that car. And confidence is such a hard thing to regain in the spotlight. 
And maybe for Sergio Perez, the better thing will just be to walk away from Red Bull, maybe find another seat and do something away from the limelight. Just bring back his confidence a, as a racing driver because clearly he's been out in the media saying that he isn't feeling the same as a person and also as a racing driver. So probably the best thing for Sergio Perez as a person, at least looking from the outside, would be to just take time off from Red Bull. Maybe for himself. Because you want to be doing this for a longer period of time, right? Not just until they sack you. But that's the thing, right, Tom? We are humans after all. The psychology will tell you that maybe taking a break, maybe the off-season would help. But giving up on a Red Bull seat, which is the one team that has dominated throughout the season, you giving up on the car, on that seat on an Adrian Newey designed RB20 would be just so difficult. And, you know, that's where you back yourself. That's where all these years of conditioning, all these years of winning in lower formulae, win, you know, literally winning with a midfield team, you know, make you back yourself that, no, I will make it work the next time I do this. And that's where probably the off-season break would work. But I would also say that when last was Red Bull just so very patient with a driver, we saw that with Alexander Rabin. Yep. And with Pierre Gasly, they had one tenth the patience with Albin and Gasly than they've had with Perez. And like I've said before, like I said this on Wire Play this weekend as well, that Red Bull's contract with Checo Perez has a lot of commercial implications as well, which is why maybe they are forced to be as patient with him because letting go of Perez prematurely would probably cost them a lot of money in the sponsorships. And, and, you know, some of these contracts are even more watertight when sponsorships are involved. And very clearly, Kunal, they're not losing any money now, are they? Because they're P1 in the championship constructors, which is where all the money mostly comes from. Yes, the points bonus thing, ah, what more could you ask for? Seriously, Red Bull are dominating. So it doesn't hurt them financially as much to have a bad Sergio Perez. But I don't think we're far away from the day when McLaren probably will be up there with both cars. Hopefully, I'm assuming that'll happen next year. And that is where it will sting a lot more. So financially, it just doesn't make sense to sack Sergio and, I don't know, upset a few sponsors, ruin a few contracts. It's fine for now until it isn't. And the reason why they weren't so patient, I suppose, with Alex and Pierre was because at that point it was hurting. Because if they had two drivers, maybe they would have been closer to Mercedes at some point. Maybe two drivers pulling in the same direction. If the deficit wasn't 200 points, it would at least be, I don't know, 150 Conjecture at the end of the day. I, I would I would turn around and say that Red Bull are planning for 24, which is why Daniel Ricciardo has been put in the Alpha Tauri, has been given time uh, in the Alpha Tauri next year. We saw different Daniel Ricciardo this weekend. We'll come to Daniel, but just one last point on Perez is that, you know, him finishing second or not is not the only thing Red Bull want to retain him for 24. They are already thinking 2024 with the car. So why won't they think 2024 with the driver, right? And at the end of the day, like you're saying, the minute the Constructors' Championship is closer, and mind you, that's where the money is. The uh, And we see, uh, you know, Aston Martin, they've been fighting with one driver. And what happened? They eventually went from second to now fifth or wherever they are, right? So Red Bull will have yep. this in their mind. But it's incredible. I think Perez is... I, I read some stat on social media. I haven't verified it. But Perez's contribution to Red Bull's total is 0.1% less. It was 32.9% from, uh, you know, in 2020 with Alexander Albon. In 2023, Perez is 32.8%. Again, social media stat. Uh, I didn't really verify it. I intend to verify it before Brazil. But when you read such stats, when you read the number of Q1 eliminations he's had, when you read the number of times he's crashed and he's finding it difficult to, you know, sort of keep up uh, into P2 in such a dominant car, you have to ask, what will it take to get Perez there? And will it even get him there eventually? Because it's such a big question mark that race after race, race after race, he's not been able to get there. And that's just unfair. And imagine Daniel Ricciardo in an Alpha Tauri out-qualified him this weekend. Even though Perez yep. was less than three tenths away from Max Verstappen, Daniel Ricciardo in the slowest car on the grid outqualified Checo Perez, who's driving the most dominant cars in history of Formula One, in qualifying on Saturday, Mexican Grand Prix. Uh, I think that's what a fresh mind does to you, because Ricciardo took some time off. Again, got some more time off, unfortunately, with a broken hand. It doesn't seem to have affected him in any way in terms of the driving, which is great, but. You can tell that this guy is fresh. It's not like a burnt piece of rope. You can hold on to it for a longer period of time. It feels like Checo's hand is suddenly... like 
if he's like he's got blisters on it, he can't hold on to it for that much longer. Similar to what we had Daniel Ricciardo uh, in at this point last year, remember? This very Mexican GP, I remember he was, he was making the most terrible of errors. A sign of a racing driver was absolutely done for. But six months away, and it makes all the difference in the world. That qualifying performance, Kunal, honestly, woke up in the morning, 11 o'clock, and I was like, what on earth happened last night? Because you don't see an Alpha Tower in P4, not less Daniel Ricciardo. I was like, wait a minute, is it is it 2016 all over again? Uh, that's that's super impressive. And honestly, as I mentioned early on, I think he's probably scored the same amount of points that Alpha Tauri have in the entire season so far in just one race, which which speaks volume considering what? I think he's the least experienced driver in that car out of the four of them that have actually done races in the Alpha Tauri. Yeah, I'll just like I'll stuff. just slightly correct the math. Alpha Tauri had 10 points. Daniel Ricciardo scored six, so they're now up to 16. They went from last to eighth right. place, so they jumped They jumped Haas and, and Alfa Romeo. Um, and they're, they're tied with Alfa Romeo, but, you know, points count back, which means Alfa Romeo is down, whatever. Anyway, so imagine, oh, you know, Daniel Ricciardo just earned, uh, you know, Alfa Tauri at least $20 million more, given that we don't know what the actual Concord Agreement finishing points are, but the usual... Metric is at every point, every position you finish higher, you are earning ten or twelve million dollars more adjusted for inflation from the central Liberty Media part. Imagine he's actually done that; he scored sixty percent of the team's point in just one race. And again, on merit, it's not that he's benefited from anything. He just came in, he got the toe from uh, uh, Yuki Sonoda in Q1 and Q2. He made the most of it to get into Q3. Q3, he made it work in the race. He made it work two races. He made it work. Daniel Ricciardo, if he is able to continue doing this and Checo Perez is also continuing to do this and you guys know we've just had a 15-minute chat, chat on Perez, maybe a swap yeah. is happening because there's no other reason they, they're trying Daniel Ricciardo out. You know, Daniel Ricciardo is not in Alfa Tauri so he goes and races for Mercedes or McLaren or Ferrari in the next few years. He's there so that he is ready to race for Red Bull. Yeah, he's not an Alpine Academy driver. He's actually going to race for the team he's intended to race for. That's just the way things are. <laughs> Letting that slide in there. Let's talk about Max Verstappen for a very quick second, right? Uh, uh, we have one minute for Max always. Every episode should we dedicate that. It's good that we're doing it in minute 14 or something that it might be. Great. Incredible result. 16 wins in a year. Uh, <laughs> and, and I love that post-race segment where Jensen Button asked him, Max, 16 race wins. What's next? 17. Yeah. Nothing. I think he's going to end this season by being by entering the top three most wins by a driver in Formula 1. After Hamilton, Michael Schumacher, and then it's going to be Max Verstappen. That's clearly just a progression of what's going to happen. Either way, whether, it not, whether or not it happens this season or next doesn't matter. It's just going to happen what i really loved was you know this whole thing there were two mexican grand prix by the way right like i said the first one he yep. went from p3 and he took the lead in at the opening lap like he did in 2021 with the mercedes car so that was out then when he had the restart and i loved the restart because everybody was wondering what tires to go on and that's what made the second part of the race or the second race interesting right max verstappen took on the hard tire because he was the only driver with two sets of hearts everybody had one etc you know lots of pre-race tire strategy implications but the most important thing is he nailed that start nobody from yep. behind him could actually jump him despite that whole long straight slip stream etc 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 that we all know you know comes into play uh, when there's a start at the uh, mexican grand prix so great stuff for him he finished i think 13 14 seconds ahead in the second race, which means whoever would have been in P2, who would have probably been, you know, 30, 40 seconds ahead. Either way. So, easy win for him, yeah. but well-deserved for Max Verstappen, I would say. I've got to add two points on that. Uh, if you've seen a lot of MotoGP this year as well, you kind of get that hint of how champions perform. And a great trait in champions is the ability not to get flustered by not having a good performance on Friday or Saturday. Like with Max Verstappen, qualifying wasn't fantastic. Um, clearly, right? He's used to being on pole all the time. Seeing that wasn't quite the best in the world. Same for Pekka Bagna and Ducati. Uh, he's really getting knocked out of Q1 in MotoGP. And they have only till Q2. So that's not as bad as Formula 1. But still, the fact of the matter is, these two champions of the sport, Kunal, they don't get flustered. They don't lose their mental stability if they have a bad start. 
Like Peko in MotoGP always tops down a couple of positions because he's leading the championship, doesn't need to push hard. With Max, terrible qualifying. I thought I thought maybe, just maybe, there'll be a hint of nervousness, like that hunger of trying to push extra hard to win it. He didn't have to. It's all under control. They are so confident in their abilities that they don't get nervous. They don't do something extra to make things happen. It's just flowing for them. And that's fantastic. That's the sign, really, of a champion, which you can see from the aura that Verstappen is carrying these days. Like, amazing, amazing stuff to see what Max is doing right now. But, as is always the case, when you have Max Verstappen, he often leaves you speechless. And at this stage, we are speechless for a second. Guys and girls, it's time for a quick break. We'll be back in a second. Welcome back in, folks, to the Inside Line F1 podcast and our Mexican GP review. We all love to talk about Lando Norris. I think today we have more than one reason to. A terrible qualifying, yes, but he's one person who genuinely gave us some entertainment in that race. It was phenomenal. I mean, apart from all the fighting fans in the stands, Lando Norris was the one person who added the most drama in the race, undoubtedly. So let's talk about that one, Kral, because I am confused in my head. Which one of his overtakes was better? I, I think the one he had on Sonoda, ooh, that's a good one. I, I would pick the one on George Russell. I love it when drivers are able to make overtakes in slower sequence of corners, which is what he did on George Russell's, you know, the switcheroo, switcheroo as we say, switch and switch back. Use the traction of better tires, better car, make the move, go on the inside. I think it was brilliant. And especially when McLaren does it to Mercedes. You know, McLaren over the years has always been the more the yeah. weaker of the, the two, you know, customer team of Mercedes and so on. But great, great drive, great teamsmanship. Again, they did the swap. You know, Lando Norris was just chasing anybody and everybody. He finished 12 positions higher in the race. <laughs> but the question has to be asked. And is he making too many mistakes in qualifying? I mean, they messed up qualifying or he messed up the first run. Second run, you know, Fernando Alonso spun, gave him the yellow flag, knocked out of Q1. Lando Norris was suddenly doing all the catch up. Very honest, you know, very humble, accepted he made the mistake. But, you know, now that the car is there, these mistakes need to stop because I think he's made a couple of mistakes in the last few races. Again, armchair critic, you call me what you want, but I'm just calling what I see on TV. I love that driver. I love the personality, the childlike personality, you know, which is so fresh in Formula One. But, Samuel, you've commentated on millions and millions of kilometers of racing, thousands and thousands of drivers as well through your iRacing network and the Indian Racing League, MotoGP and the stuff. At a point, at what point do you actually realize and say, yes, great driver, but needs to stop making mistakes, especially when the machinery is suddenly or finally there. Ooh, that's such a that's such a tricky one, right? I think with the best of the best, I think they realize it before you do, to be very honest with you. Because you only see part of it, right? Uh, there are so many micro things that go on. Things like, a really fun insight actually that I got uh, at the Indian Racing League testing that's actually happening right now as I speak. We're going to be there in what, six hours in, uh, in the morning. After that, uh, going to be a lot of fun. But one of the engineers who's actually worked with a lot of the top, top drivers in sports car racing and Formula One as well, some of them, can't name who they are, can't name who the engineer is as well, privacy. But uh, he told me that drivers really check out things like brake pressure bar as well. Like how, how hard are they braking? Are they braking at 40 bar or 42 bar, which their teammate might be braking at? And even these sort of things, they look at micro mistakes like that and the drivers themselves know that they're not doing the best thing that they possibly are. So more than we see it, I think the drivers know better about when they are making the mistakes. So firstly, there's that internal level of realization that, hey, I'm probably not being at that same level that I should ideally be at. And then it creeps in it because it's a matter of, uh, for, for some, it could be a matter of underconfidence. For Lando, I suppose it's a lot more that since he's in that groove, in that stripe, he's, he's potentially maybe... Uh, so confident that he's missing out on some parts of his game, like track limits in Qatar. I mean, that's a painful one, right? Seriously, when you're so at one with the car, putting in a lap time like that one, and having such a good qualifying, that must be hitting you like a dagger in your heart. So for Lando, I suppose, from what I can tell from uh, from my judgment, it seems like a lot more of that. But to answer your question, uh, I think firstly, the drivers know. And then it's a matter of analyzing at what stage of the career are they. Is it underconfidence, overconfidence? For Lando, it seems more of the... I, I can't say overconfidence, but... 
I can't even say lack of focus or lack of attention to detail. It's just that some things tend to slip out. Lack of concentration, maybe? I don't know what the... I, you can't label it as something in a way. But yeah, that's what it is. And Lando himself said if he started up... I mean, he said after qualifying, I should have been on pole today. And he himself said I would have probably been in the top three, if nothing else. He said it hurts, but hopefully it's hurt him enough uh, for him to turn around and say, I will make sure I don't make these mistakes again. And I say this because I am a big fan of who he is as a driver and as a personality as well. But, uh, you know, talking of driver and personalities, Mercedes, Lewis Hamilton, second place, are the upgrades finally working? Does seem like it. They finished on the medium. They finished 14 seconds behind Max Verstappen, who was on the hard. But yep. that's a comparison with Max. The the big the big question, and I love Toto Wolff. He said, we've been hearing Lewis's complaints on the radio for the last 12 years, saying the tires won't last. But they actually do, which was great because we actually saw hammer time for second place, which I, I thought was fun. And we also... First place. Okay, first place. First yes. place. Sommel is a Formula 1.5 fan. <laughs> we can do that. Yeah, for, and, and also Mercedes, after their slow pit stops uh, in Kota, said we are going to try and do them quick and try and at least match Red Bull. And they actually gave 2.5 second pit stops for both their drivers, which is pretty good, I would say. And... You know, my, my, my final thing about the whole Mercedes thing was their upgrades are working. They didn't have a side part till several races ago. Now they have a side part. They are the most consistent car in P2. Uh, and, and that's what we probably saw this weekend in Mexico as well. Lewis loves Mexico. He's won two of his world titles in Mexico, his fifth and sixth, if I remember correctly. And probably the only thing that's, you know, struggling to fire in Mercedes is George Russell. I don't even know, honestly. But it gets lost under that Verstappen limelight. But imagine if it was just Formula 1.5. I think we'd be speculating about Russell's lack of performance just as much as we are doing for Sergio Perez. But I don't think I don't I don't know. Have, have you have you find have you found a uh, how do I put it? It's so confusing that I forget how to articulate my words. It's interesting how that happens. But have you found an answer to why that is the case or even like a rough idea to roughly what it might be? Because it's strange, isn't it, Kunal? When Russell's performing, Hamilton isn't. When Hamilton is performing, Russell isn't. I don't remember one weekend where both the cars have genuinely been at a fighting pace, gunning for two podium places. It's, it's always been either one up, one down. And it's been inconsistent. Maybe one has a bad qualifying once. Maybe the other one has a bad setup once. Uh, It's all very random stuff. But have you been able to get down to the bottom of what really has gone wrong? Actually, the one race I remember was Singapore. But then Russell had that uh, that, uh, gap moment over there. So, it's confusing, isn't it? What's really going on there? I, I haven't been able to find one good article from any paddock source a one word from any driver, a one word from any Mercedes engineer, or any of the people who we know in the paddock, getting a concrete answer of that. I don't think even they know for the matter. I think that's a brilliant observation. It's either of the two drivers firing, not both of them, most races, or for a large part of the races. And maybe it's down to the team just trying too much, testing too much, experimenting too much. We've seen that before. Maybe they realize that we will be P2. Let's just keep testing, 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 keep accumulating data, doing different things. That could be one of them, uh, I guess so. But uh, we have to talk. We have to commend Lewis Hamilton for his overtake on Charles Leclerc when he was put on the grass, committed, he went for it, made it happen. Uh, I I kind of like that. The big question in this whole Hamilton-Leclerc thing was, why did Ferrari let Hamilton undercut Carlos Sainz? That's one question. Just Ferrari thinks. I don't think they have an answer either. Maybe they just wanted Sainz yeah. to meddle in uh, Lewis's place so Charles could finish ahead of Lewis. That's my only assumption that would have happened, right? <laughs> uh, because Ferrari went from 1-2 at the start to, I think, 3-4 at the finish, which was weird, but again, just Ferrari things. And, you know, talking of teams and preparations and stuff... Lewis, he always complains about tires. And then suddenly that we, we call that as hammer time post-race, which means he's eked out more from the tires than the simulation data would have suggested or whatever, right? He's just managed his tires really well while keeping up pace. That's what the definition of hammer time is. When it comes to Ferrari, why is it that they are the one team that reads tires wrong more than anyone else in the top? Because if you remember, Xavi came onto the radio 
to Leclerc and said, we think that the hard will be the faster tire in five laps and that those five laps never came. That crossover effect (laughs) was predicted so wrong that the Ferrari chose the hard tire for those 36 odd laps that were remaining, but it just wasn't meant to be. I can't explain it, honestly. Uh, That seemed like a very grayish call in a way. That that was a bit of a weird thing. But before we end out, I think it's a really, really fun time to pick a few underrated drivers from this entire weekend. Very quickly, Kunal. Oh, I really enjoyed watching Alex Albon. Great to see him in the points. It's phenomenal the way things went out as well. Uh, we have spoken about Lando Norris. His, his drive was amazing. Ricardo's also been given all the laurels. Do you think Esteban Ocon's drive was underrated in a way? Because the, the red flag really helped him a lot, like gaining 20 seconds immediately after having like that restart. But nevertheless, what he did in the second half of the race was also quite quite solid, actually, I think. Yeah, I mean, great recovery for Esteban, especially after having, he had, you know, a Q1 elimination, as we remember, which was very, very strange. So great great for him because he actually finished how many positions I have from Q1 to uh, some position. The, the, the position counter got reset at that time. But anyway, uh, for Ocon, I loved his radio message saying, I've seen too much of that Haas. Just tell them I'm going to go for it. And then Nico Hulkenberg saying, yeah. you loved my rear too much. You spent too much time trying to overtake me rather than actually overtaking me. But that actually tells me my most <laughs> underrated driver was Nico Hulkenberg, who held up what I would call as the Hulkenberg DRS train. Although he didn't have the DRS, it was just the Haas straight line speed that kept him ahead. Something something we've seen with the Williams before as well. But the minute his tires gave up, he just fell down the order and then just couldn't recover from there. But that's just the story of Nico Hulkenberg, I would say, uh, who is my choice for the most underrated driver. I, I was a little disappointed and just Talking just one last, you know, disappointing driver, another one from the Red Bull stables, Yuki Sonoda. I thought he had the pace to make a solid recovery. He was doing really well. And then he made one of those Checo Perez disc uh over ambitious moves again into turn one, spun yeah. himself out, got mad at his engineer, and then just went downhill from there to finish twelfth. Calm down, Yuki. You were turning out to be so well in the last few races. Relax. Take it easy. I think Emotions run high, right, at times. And and we saw that so much with Sergio Perez this time, with Yuki Tsunoda as well. Hopefully, firstly, hoping that Sergio Perez gets back in the right frame of mind as a person because then we know the better performances are coming. And same you can also say for someone like Yuki Tsunoda as well. But they'll have another opportunity in Brazil. And that comes up next week, uh, believe it or not. So the end of the triple header at last... And join us for our pre-race preview for that, folks, this coming Thursday. That'll be on the Inside Line F1 podcast on all platforms. So make sure that you're subscribing to us everywhere so that you're in touch with everything that we're doing. Folks, I'll see you for the Brazil GP preview on the Inside Line F1 podcast. And until then, bye-bye, have fun, and please, please try to contemplate what Max Verstappen meant when he said that this Madison crash wasn't meant to be a red flag. I don't get it. You have good time to think. Bye-bye, folks. 